All right, good afternoon. Welcome back. Today we're going to talk about vaccines, how to prevent a viral disease. Notice I didn't say infection. Vaccines don't prevent infection. But that was a misconception during COVID, uh, which we'll talk about when we do COVID on its own. We're going to talk about how vaccines are made and um, how they prevent disease. Vaccines are great defense against viruses. They use your immune system and memory to prevent disease. So immune memory is an important part. And our increased life expectancy is in large part due to vaccines as well as medicine in general and public health measures. So we used to live in 1900, our life expectancy was on average, this is, now people could live longer or shorter, 50 years or so. <clears throat> and look at it, it went up and up and up until it's now around 80 for women. And that drop in 1918, what, what was that? Yeah, it was the pandemic, the 1918 pandemic, which killed probably, well, tens of millions of people, who knows how many. But of course, so that lowers your life expectancy and it recovers. So that's an interesting question. What did COVID do to life expectancy? And here's a graph from 1980 to 2020 showing trends in life expectancy by ethnicity. And you can see there's a big difference right? Depend this is healthcare disparity, basically, shown here. Blacks are having a really low life expectancy compared to whites and Latinos the most. I didn't know that they have a better life expectancy than others. Nevertheless, you can see in 2020, it dropped considerably due to the COVID pandemic. I think the expectancy went down about, I want to say a year and a half. It's not on this slide, but it dropped substantially. And of course it will recover at some point, but that's, oh, there it is, one and a half years it dropped in 2020. So this is what pandemics with lots of mortality can do. So when someone says COVID isn't serious, it's a, it's a hoax, blah, 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 I hope none of you ever believe that, okay? Just call them out because it's not. There are plenty of data that says it's not. We'll get to that in a minute. <clears throat> So I want you to remember that vaccines stimulate an immune response and we make memory to the vaccines, both B and T cell memory. And here, this is shown in this graph. We have on the Y axis, we have B and T cell responses. And on the X axis, we have time and days. So you have an infection or a vaccination it takes some time to get an immune response, to get antibodies and T cells made maybe seven to 14 days. So there's a delay in which time the virus is reproducing in you. There's nothing you can do about that. And in fact, in most acute infections, the infection begins to be cleared before the adaptive response kicks in. Eventually, those levels of antibodies and B cells wane or decline, and they go down to baseline levels. And then years later or months later, if you are reinfected, you have a more rapid response by the immune system because you have memory. All those B and T cells are kept so they don't have to do all the rearranging that is done, like we talked about during adaptive immunity. So very quickly, you can respond with B and T cells, but it's not immediate. It's still a couple of days. So you're gonna get a mild or an inapparent infection. And I put depends there. Depends how old you are, depends what other diseases you have. If you're, if you're 85 and you have issues, you might get more severe disease. You might, get, you might end up in the hospital. In fact, there's, there's probably no vaccine that's gonna keep you out of the hospital. So to say that a vaccine should do that is unrealistic, it just is not within the purview. There we have to depend on antivirals, which we'll talk about next time. And so in COVID, as we'll talk about more in a COVID lecture, there was this expectation that the vaccines would prevent infection and all disease. All they had to do was look at an immunology textbook to realize that that's not correct. But the press blew it because they talked to the wrong people who didn't remember uh, basic immunology. The first vaccines 
Well, variolation was practiced in China. We talked about that in the first lecture. Smallpox was a huge scourge. It killed many people throughout humanity. And in China and many other places, they recognized that the survivors of smallpox never got it again. They didn't know what caused it, no idea, nothing known about infectious diseases, but it seemed to be passed from person to person. And smart people said, hmm, the survivors get it. So let's give it to people intentionally. So that's what variolation is. They would take a few pustules from a patient, grind them up and either blow it in their nose or scrape it into their skin and you would get an infection and a third of the time you would die, but two thirds of the time you would survive and you'd be immune. So that was practiced as early as the 11th century. In 1796, Jenner developed the smallpox vaccine. Again, we talked about that based on the idea that milkmaids who got cowpox lesions on their hands from milk, milking the cows never got smallpox. So he, he immunized the boy with cowpox virus and it protected him. He did a challenge study actually. Uh, and so then that was really the first uh, widely used human vaccine. It spread globally over the next years. People wanted to do the Jenner vaccine. Uh, Pasteur made a rabies vaccine in 1885. Although remember in 1885, we don't know what viruses are. We just know that they're infectious agents. And he called it vaccine in honor of Jenner because Jenner's vaccine was based on a cow virus, right? Cowpox. It may, probably isn't the cow virus. It's probably actually horse pox virus that infected a cow. But we're not going to change the name to equination now. Be, you know, equi, horse, probably not. We'll just keep it vaccination. Yellow fever vaccines, influenza vaccines developed in the 1930s. By the way, that's a bifurcated needle with a drop of smallpox vaccine in it, and you deliver it to the individual by scraping the outer skin and uh, getting the virus in there. Now, when Jenner developed his vaccine, people, there were immediately anti-vaxxers from the very beginning. This is a woodcut from Jenner's time, right? It says the cowpox or the wonderful effects of the new inoculation via the publication of the anti-vaccine society. People have been stupid since day one, apparently. So here people are growing cow parts out of their noses and eyes and arms after getting the, the, the smallpox vaccine. And this persists, this stupidity, I should say it's greed actually, persists to this day. Nevertheless, vaccines work. And large scale vaccination campaigns are incredibly successful. These are two graphs showing you eradication of, or near eradication of polio, at least in the US, but we'll come back to that later. These are cases per 100,000. Y-axis, this is year, big peak of polio post-World War II, and we introduced two vaccines which essentially eliminated disease from the US as long as you're vaccinated. Measles, same story, the vaccine introduced in the 60s, rapid elimination of measles, but as we saw the other day, if you don't get vaccinated, you still have outbreaks. And measles shown on the right graph, these are lives saved by measles vaccination. So the, the dark curve, the dark line is the estimated measles deaths in the absence of vaccination. So this is measles deaths in millions. So a million, million and a half deaths every year. And you can see the lives, uh, actually the deaths with vaccination declining after the vaccine. And these are all the people's lives who have been saved. So this is not trivial. Vaccines work. They're an integral part of our existence. We immunize children, we immunize adults. We immunize our pets, we immunize even wild animals. We immunize wild animals against rabies by drape, dropping bait into the forest that contains rabies uh, vaccine in it. They, we're even immunizing fish. Look, the, the upper right, it's a fish being immunized against a fish virus that would otherwise make it unsuitable for sale. And because of this, childhood diseases are rare. When I grew up, everybody got measles and mumps and rubella and other things because we didn't have vaccines. But now people don't have it and they're a faint memory and perhaps that's why we have so much, in part, why we have so much anti-vaccine uh, sentiment. They are a major part of our public health system. We require them for entry into schools, 
but in low and middle income countries, they are not yet part of general public health. And so that's why, for example, we have measles outbreak throughout the world, as I showed you previously. When you have hesitancy about vaccines, that is a real problem for a vaccine program. And the ability or the acceptance of vaccines by the public depends on confidence of them in the vaccines, the convenience of getting them, and whether people think that the diseases are a problem, whether we should prevent them. So when they go away from children, parents think we don't have to vaccinate kids anymore. And confidence can easily be broken by anti-vaccine activists. They have a, a business to break confidence in vaccines. Why? I'll show you in a moment. It's to sell their own crap. It's to sell their own uh, supplements, which they will tell you prevent the diseases. And it's really sad that people fall for this. So many people say these things. These are all different quotes that people use as excuses for not getting vaccinated. And each one of these are refutable, but people don't want to listen to logic when vaccine. Look, I got a flu vaccine and yeah, I, got, I know a guy who got a flu vaccine and then got the flu. Okay, so if you got it a week before, you're going to still get infected. You need two weeks or so to get an immune response. But maybe you had mild influenza. That's fine. Did you survive? Did you go in the hospital? No, no. It worked. It doesn't prevent infection. I don't have time this year. I can't afford to. Vaccines should be available to everyone, in my opinion, uh, as we saw during COVID, but should be applicable to all vaccines. Kids should get infected naturally, really. You want to take the risk of one in a thousand encephalitis for measles. Anyway, that's the problem with vaccine programs. And it's gotten worse in recent years because of social media where it's easy to get any message out. There are actually um, some cases where medical exemptions to vaccination are warranted. About 1% of the population have medical issues that prevent them from getting vaccinated. And you can have your physician write an exemption and that's fine. So kids in many states need to, in all states need to have certain vaccines to go to school. You can have a medical exemption. The problem is many states now, as I showed you in a graph when we talked about measles, have religious and personal exemptions. And they're just, they're bogus. I don't care how you put it. There's only one religion, I forget which one it is, where it's written into the, I don't know what you call the book of that religion, that you can't have vaccines, but all the other ones are bogus. And so we get in some parts of Texas, for example, 50% exemptions to vaccines are granted. This is just absurd. Anyway, this um, whole issue we talked about on the TWIV episode, uh, we talked about exemptions and other issues about vaccination. Uh, the last thing I want to tell you about is that often um, vaccine outbreaks of infectious diseases are tied to religious communities. So uh, on the left is again, the graph of measles cases over the years, which I've shown to you already. And on the right, we have a map of the US with measles outbreaks in different states. And then the, uh, the orange are cases not tied to religious communities, but then we have cases tied to unvaccinated members of religious communities. We have a big one in Brooklyn uh, in 2018. Uh, these are unvaccinated members of an Orthodox Jewish community. We often have outbreaks in unvaccinated Orthodox communities because the rabbi somehow gets it into their mind that vaccination is bad. And then they list people, the followers listen to the rabbi, but most of the time the rabbi is listening to an anti-vaxxer and that's the problem. There's a, there was an outbreak in Hare Krishna community, largely unvaccinated. The senior pastor in this Texas church was critical of measles. Really, the pastor knows about vaccines and immunology and infectious disease. I doubt it. He just heard something and is passing on. And the sad part is that the, the congregation listens to their leader, right? Finally, the, the um, there is a misinformation business. There are about a dozen people in the US who make millions of dollars spewing anti-vaccine rhetoric and selling their own crap. The biggest one is Joe Mercola. He's a physician in Florida. 
he has millions of followers and he sells his own stuff that he tells you will prevent infectious diseases. During COVID, he sold hydrogen peroxide and quercetin as treatments for COVID. He claimed COVID vaccines were medical fraud. They don't prevent infections. Hey, Joe, vaccines don't prevent infections. They never did. They don't provide immunity. They don't stop the spread of disease. They alter your genetic coding, turning you into a viral protein factory that has no off switch. So I hope every one of you recognize the BS in all of this. It's just outright lies, right? You can see that, but there are many people who can't. They're afraid of COVID, they're afraid of COVID vaccines, maybe because the messaging hasn't been right. So they listen to Joe Mercola and they buy his stuff. And he and others do the same thing. They always have dietary supplements which they claim will save you. And so if you ever wonder what the motivation is for anti-vaccine activists like him, it's profit. That's all there is. And they don't care if you die as a consequence. By the way, this last statement, mRNA vaccines alter your genetic coding. No, it doesn't. There's no, there's no evidence that it does. And it's a, it has no off switch. Actually, this is a great exam question. Why is it not right to say there's no off switch? I'm gonna put that on as an extra credit. You should know why mRNA has its own off switch, right? But either he doesn't know or he doesn't want to tell you. Anyway, this is a real problem, folks. And you're, if you're gonna be physicians one day, immunizing people, you're gonna encounter it. So start thinking about how you're gonna deal with it. Because your job is to keep your patients healthy. And not giving a vaccine to them is not a way to do that. All right, let's talk about the actual vaccines now. There are two kinds of vaccines. There's an active vaccine and a passive. Active, you give the pathogen to the recipient. It's either modified or it's a part of the pathogen. So you don't get disease, but you get immunity. This gives you memory. It gives you long-term protection. A passive vaccine is putting in either antibodies or T cells, usually antibodies. We don't do T cell therapy yet for, for infections, but this gives you short-term protection. Passive is just giving you antibodies, and a famous passive vaccine is the rabies antibody. It's a vial of rabies immune globulin. They immunize people with rabies vaccine. They take their serum and, and sell it, and if you get a dog bite or a bite by a rabid animal, one of the first things they do is inject the antibody at the bite site to try and neutralize as much virus as possible. And then they will actually immunize you on top of it with rabies vaccine. All right, those are the two kinds. Let's talk just a little bit about passive vaccines. Your mom gave you a passive vaccine when you were developing in utero. This is the fraction of adult values of, of antibody on the y-axis with time. We have conception, we have the, the nine months of development here and then birth. So during development, fetal development, your mother is passively transferring to you maternal IgG. And when you're born, you don't have an immune system that can respond yet. It needs some time to develop. You're protected from your mother's immune infection experience. And recently, a vaccine for respiratory syncytial virus was just approved. This hits babies starting at birth and on, and first year of life, very hard to vaccinate them. So we vaccinate the mother and those antibodies get passively transferred into the developing fetus. So the fetus is protected for about six months. You can see the maternal antibodies decline, but by then the, the fetus, can, the baby can make their own antibodies. And so you could then immunize them, say at six months of age. So that's a passive vaccine. Uh, we use convalescent serum to treat infections. And a really good example was uh, during Lassa virus years. So Lassa virus was first observed in Nigeria. There were nurses working there who uh, started to get sick and it turned out to be a novel virus crossing over from rodents. Um, and Jordi Casals was a virologist at Yale who was working with the virus and, and infected himself. And so he went into the hospital and the hospital, which was Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center, had previously treated Penny Pinio, who was one of the nurses from Nigeria who had been brought back and treated there and she survived, but they kept some of her blood and they gave him serum and he, he survived. And now, of course, more recently, um, 
we use convalescent plasma for, we used to anyway, for treating COVID patients. So here are two examples of passive therapy for COVID, convalescent plasma. So plasma is different from serum, right? Plasma is what you get when you take out the cells and you prevent clotting, whereas serum is what you get after the blood clots and you spin everything out, including the cells. So we use convalescent plasma. So we basically take a COVID patient who's recovered, we take out blood and we make plasma and we can give it to people to prevent infection or to treat an infection. And so early on in the pandemic, when we didn't have anything else, this was used quite a bit. It's not used very much anymore. And then of course, subsequently monoclonal antibodies were developed of all different names, as you can see here, that were directed to different parts of the viral spike protein and they would block interaction with ACE2 and they were effective at preventing infection. The, the antigenic variation in the spike over the years basically made all of these not useful. Although recently FDA has just approved or you given an emergency use authorization to a, a new monoclonal antibody, uh, which can be used because many people don't respond to vaccination. Immunosuppressed people, for example, don't respond. Right, so that's a passive vaccine, uh, some examples of that. The first question is, uh, passive vaccination A takes place between mother and developing fetus. B involves giving antibodies or convalescent plasma to the patient. C confers short-term protection against disease. D, although administered intravenously, may still protect against respiratory disease. E, all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got it. It's <laughs> <clears throat> Let's see if you can get the 10. That was number seven, right? Yeah, they're all right. So I didn't say, I, yeah, so the convalescent plasma is given intravenously and yet it protects against respiratory disease. So obviously antibodies can cross into the mucosa from the blood and that's it's the same for vaccines that are injected into your muscle, arm muscle. They protect you from respiratory diseases because the antibodies can get there. That's absolutely right. Very right, great. Very good. All right, so what are the requirements for an effective vaccine? You have to make the right immune response, right? Remember that when, um, when, when we make immune responses, they can be either Th1 or Th2, in other words, favoring cytotoxic T responses or antibody responses or some combination of the both. So you have to make sure that you do the right thing. Now for COVID, we didn't know, right? We had no history of understanding the disease. So all we did is look for protection. And in fact, in many cases, it's empirical. You try a vaccine and you see if it protects. We were very lucky that the spike protein worked. The logic was, well, it's how the virus attaches to receptors. So maybe antibodies will protect and they, they ended up doing it. So we were very lucky. And we still don't quite understand to this day why they protect us. Many people will tell you, oh, it's definitely antibodies. No, it's not the whole story. Because even when the virus has changed enough so that the antibodies induced by the vaccine no longer neutralize, many people are still protected from serious disease. And that's because the T cells are resolving the infection. So it is not yet clear what's going on. In fact, there's, there was a recently a challenge study done in the UK and they studied the immune responses associated with recovery from mild COVID. And they said T cells are a big part of recovering. All right, so you, know, you need to know what the immune, prop, proper immune response is. And then you have to be protected against disease. It's not good enough just to make antibodies or T cells. You have to show that uh, those are protective against disease. And you initially hopefully have an animal model in which to do that. And there were few for COVID. So mainly we looked at the induction of antibodies, which you would say is not enough, but then they did huge clinical trials to validate that. It could be that even though the vaccines induced neutralizing antibodies, it might not have protected against disease in, in humans. That was the chance we were taking. We're very lucky that everything aligned. Also, the, the vaccines have to be safe, of course, they can't cause the disease you're trying to protect, but they can't have severe side effects. They must be minimal. And you know, if you do a 40,000 person clinical trial, you will pick up 
side effects that occur at one in 10,000 or so, but you're not gonna pick up a side effect that happens in one in a million people. And that's what happened with myocarditis induced by the mRNA vaccines or clotting induced by the adenovirus vector vaccines. They were more rare than, than we found. You can't do a million person clinical trial. It's just not feasible. Yet people will say, aha, uh -huh, you see, you fooled us, you lied, and they're actually side effects. No, it's just that you don't pick it up until you introduce it into people. It's always about the, the benefit risk ratio. You have to weigh what's the benefit of getting vaccinated against se severe disease versus the risk of the vaccine itself. It always tilts in favor of vaccination. It always tilts that way, but people have a hard time uh, making those kinds of decisions. It should, of course, induce protective immunity in the population. That's why we, after we, we license a vaccine in a big clinical trial, we, do, we, we follow it for many years afterwards. The protection should be long lasting. The only way you know that is to follow it for many years, right? So far, we know that COVID vaccine protection appears to last a few years. Is it gonna last five years, 10 years? We don't know. You can't predict. I don't, you can have all the AI you want. You can't predict how long it's gonna be until you're there and then you can look back. The WHO wants vaccines to be cheap. Of course, they should be genetically stable if we're talking about infectious virus vaccines. They have to be stored properly. Remember the first mRNA vaccines had to be stored on dry ice. So they had to figure out how to get FedEx to ship all this dry ice stuff to, to clinics and so forth. Subsequently, they realized they don't have to be on dry ice, but many vaccines do have to be frozen. And that is a um, kerosene fired freezer developed by WHO that keeps vaccines frozen. And you can see the size of it compared to the people loading it onto the truck there. And the delivery. Most of our vaccines are delivered by needle. And many people don't like needles, even adults. And Adults don't want to give their kids needles because they feel bad for them. So that's a lot of vaccine hesitancy right there. So it would be nice if more were oral, but they're not going to be. But we have some other alternatives, which I'll, I'll tell you about. So let's talk about different kinds of vaccines and how they're made. So here we start with a parental virus that causes some disease for which we need a vaccine. And, you know, that's an interesting question, right? COVID was a no brainer, right? Because it was clear we we're gonna have hundreds of thousands of infections. But what if you have a virus that causes a few hundred infections a year? Should we develop a vaccine for those? Well, the answer is yes, because a few hundred, if they all die, that's significant. And human deaths, human, the human life is valuable. The problem is, Companies don't want to invest in that. There's no market to pay for the vaccine because vaccine development is a for-profit industry. So now we are seeing, and we'll, we'll talk more about this later, uh, nonprofits get involved in the early development of vaccines. So Nipah virus infection happens in Bangladesh and certain parts of India. It's spread by bats to people and people can die of it, but nobody wanted to develop a vaccine. So a nonprofit stepped in, raised money, and now we have a phase one trial ongoing for that. So uh, hopefully, if there's an outbreak, it could be used in, to be tested in an outbreak situation. Anyway, so that's the, ver the parent virus. We can make infectious vaccines by attenuating the, the virulence or reducing it. We can chemically inactivate the virus. We can break it up and make a subunit vaccine. Or we can clone individual genes and use that. For example, we can make the protein, which in some cases will assemble into capsids. We'll see an example of that today we can make, um, we can vector the particular viral gene in a vi another virus. So we took the spike gene of SARS-CoV-2 and vectored it in adenoviruses for several vaccines. Uh, and then of course this, for this pandemic, mRNA vaccines were brand new. For years, we tried to make DNA vaccines where you take the gene for say a spike protein, put it in a plasmid, and injected it to people, but they never worked. But mRNA vaccines did work. And I was very skeptical of them. I didn't think they'd work because DNA vaccines had failed, but they're much better, get much better expression. And the, the encapsulation in a lipid nanoparticle really was great. 
So this is a list of uh, virus vaccines licensed in the US. Some of them have special applications. For example, there's an adenovirus vaccine, which is only given to military recruits because when you put all these people together, they all get sick because they swap their viruses and adeno is a big cause. So we, we immunized armed forces with those. We have hep A for travelers, for example, uh, Japanese encephalitis for travelers because we don't have these infections here. So those are some uh, travel. Then we have a rabies vaccine, which you're not gonna get unless you're a vet or you're studying wildlife, but most of us will get it after being bitten and it will still work. Here's yellow fever vaccine is another travel associated vaccine. But then we have vaccines that are routinely given to kids. Um, so hep B should be given to all kids. Then we have measles and mumps, rubella, polio vaccine. Nobody gets smallpox vaccine anymore because there's no more smallpox, but lab workers could get it. And the military probably does because it's a bioterror threat. And uh, we have influenza vaccines and so forth. And this is just for your reference, you can see the schedule of doses. And here, of course, are the more recent ones. There's an Ebola virus vaccine, and in the US anyway, two mRNA vaccines and a protein-based COVID vaccine. So let's talk about inactivated vaccines. You take a virus, an infectious virus, you treat it with a chemical, and it's no longer infectious. Formalin, beta propiolactone, some detergents, the key here is no more infectious virus and the antigenicity is present. So a couple of examples we're gonna talk about today. Poliomyelitis is a disease that emerged in epidemic form uh, in the 1900s. It's a, it used to be a common disease uh, where people had these nonspecific symptoms and then in some cases you'd get paralysis and 1% of the infections you would get uh, paralysis. That's a graph of the cases of polio in the US. These are paralytic cases starting in about 1900. You can see many big outbreaks uh, culminating with uh, huge outbreaks in the 50s. This was, these are fueled by the baby boomers, right? The babies born to service people coming back from World War II. And uh, that gives more hosts for the virus. So um, hospitals used to be full of iron lungs so that you could, if, if it affected your respiratory muscles, you could breathe. And FDR, of course, had polio as a young man and he could not walk without assistance. So he uh, set up the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, which raised money to develop the two polio vaccines that we use today. And one of them is an activated polio vaccine <clears throat> developed by Jonas Salk. It's the virus is treated with formalin it was subjected to a clinical trial in 1954 of 1.8 million children. So you have to remember that at this time, polio was scaring everybody, especially parents of young kids, because you could get paralyzed permanently. So it was a big impetus to have a vaccine. And this clinical trial resulted in 50% protection against paralysis. That's all they measured back then. And it was licensed on April 12th which is the anniversary is just in a few days now, actually, and big headlines greeting this. You can see people were really scared of polio. Unfortunately, one company, Cutter Labs, didn't properly inactivate the vaccine. And so a few hundred kids got polio from IPV. And this was a real problem. It started big time vaccine uh, litigation. Anyway, the way this <clears throat> vaccine works is it's injected into the muscle, you make antibodies in the blood, and those antibodies will interrupt the virus in the bloodstream. So the virus is acquired orally, it replicates in the intestinal mucosa, spreads to the blood, and that's where it will be interrupted by antibodies produced by IPV, inactivated polio vaccine. In 1% of cases, the virus gets into the brain and causes paralysis, but uh, the, the antibodies induced by the vaccine will prevent that. So very good at preventing. Notice, that, remember, 50% protection in that clinical trial. Do you remember what the protection against COVID was in the mRNA vaccine trials? It's over 90%. I remember the FDA director said, if the COVID vaccines are more than 50% protective, we will license them. That's 
this is the precedent for that. So they licensed it. Now it's much better than 50% because the vaccines have improved. Anyway, the introduction of inactivated vaccine in 1955 dropped the number of cases to a few thousand a year. Uh, and then we went to another vaccine, which we'll talk about in a bit. There's an influenza virus inactivated vaccine. You remember what influenza virus looks like, an envelope negative stranded virus with eight segments of RNA. Remember there are three types, A, B, and C, and we vaccinate against A and B. And the reason is because it can cause a lot of deaths every year. I showed you the influenza deaths previously. And so we originally made uh, influenza vaccines by growing the virus in embryonated chicken eggs. We would formal it and activate it and distribute many millions of doses each year. It's about 60% effective preventing influenza, severe influenza in children and adults less than 65 years of age. But the protection is not durable. It doesn't last a long time. So we do need better uh, vaccines. And the protection correlates with antibodies against the surface proteins of the virus. Now you can get different kinds of flu vaccines. There are flu vaccines made in cell culture as well uh, as in eggs. <clears throat> but because the virus changes each year, the HA and the NA change, they can evade immunity produced by the vaccine. So we have to select new strains every year. And the first few months of the year, January, February, we pick the strains for the flu season, which starts in the fall. Sometimes we get it right, sometimes we don't. And uh, the 2020-23 vaccine, for example, had four different viruses. It has a, a two different A viruses and two different B viruses. And the, the procedure for doing that is shown here. So you select the strains in January, February, you make the viruses. So you produce viruses that grow really well in eggs using the HA and the NA of the vaccine. You standardize the vaccine, you make sure it's potent, you review it, package it, and then by August, you can start vaccinating people. And um, this is a very secret process. Apparently we talked about it on TWIV 413. So we have to do this every year to make sure we're vaccinating people with the strains that are circulating. And the reason is that the HA changes maybe one or two amino acids every year, and that's enough to make your antibodies induced by the vaccine not useful, not protective. So here's the HA of the virus, and in colors are the antigenic sites. And one amino acid change in just one of those is enough to make the vaccine-induced immunity not as good as it should be, and you get more severe disease. So that's why we change uh, the vaccine on a regular basis. Which statement about inactivated viral vaccines is incorrect? Chemicals can be used to inactivate infectivity. They do not replicate. They can be dangerous if inactivation is not complete. Antigenic variation can make them ineffective. None of the above are incorrect. All right, how did we do? No, we didn't get it. So they're all, none of them are incorrect. Chemicals can be used, everybody got that. They do not replicate. Uh, inactivated vaccines don't replicate. They're, that's why we call them inactivated. Antigenic variation can make them ineffective. Yeah, I just, told you that, right, for, <laughs> for flu vaccines. But a lot of you picked that, so maybe I didn't make it clear. Let, let's go back to that slide. Antigenic drift. One amino acid change in these epitopes can make the vaccine ineffective, and that's why we do this rigmarole every year of uh, selecting an influenza virus vaccine. Envelope proteins change each year. New strains must be selected in the first few months for manufacture. Whether we do this for SARS-CoV-2 or not is a good question, because we have antigenic variation there. I'm, just, I'm not convinced that making a matched vaccine every year is needed. There are no data that would suggest that, but we have plenty of data for influenza virus. <clears throat> Next, we talk about subunit vaccines. Now, we're not going to talk about it, not, not inactivated, where we take the whole particle and inject that, basically. But here, we can take the virus and break it up and, and purify some component, and then immunize with those. And that's what we used for many years. But now we clone the viral gene of interest. We can express it in bacteria, in yeast, in insect cells, in cell culture. We can purify the protein and use that as an immunogen. Uh, 
And usually we're using a membrane protein like a spike protein. So Novavax vaccine is the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2 purified. And um, sometimes it's a capsid protein and it assembles into capsids. So you get, as you can see in the picture, virus-like particles. So the capsid looks very much like the capsid of the virus. So it's antigenically very similar, but there's no nucleic acid, so it's not infectious. A really good uh, recombinant protein vaccine is Shingrix. This is against varicella zoster virus. So many people got infected with chickenpox, like me as a kid. And so the virus is latent in me and I could get shingles. In fact, when I turned 50, I got shingles, you know, just, just like that. Just, it was like the first few episodes of TWIV, actually, I got shingles. It was episode eight, and I, so I could talk about it on, on the podcast. And so for me, a, shing a shingles vaccine is great because when the virus reactivates in the nerves, then the vaccine immunity will become activated and prevent the rash. So this is a recombinant glycoprotein. It's produced in mammalian cells in a form that's secreted into the medium. It's purified, it's mixed with an adjuvant, a chemical that helps get inflammation, and then it's injected. So I, I just last year got my Shingrix vaccine and it's really good protection against uh, shingles. Um, so that's, that's a great one. I like that very much. There's another one, which is the hepatitis B virus vaccine. Remember, hep B causes cancer. This will prevent cancer. It's the surface protein, hepatitis B surface antigen produced in yeast. So the virus particle is shown here. It's got a icosahedral capsid with that uh, gapped double-stranded, partially double-stranded DNA. And then there's a membrane and then the surface antigen is in the membrane. And if you just make the protein, the surface antigen on itself, you get these incomplete particles of different sizes and that's mixed with adjuvant and injected. And so this is the vaccine that every baby should get because you can get hepatitis from your mom and in babies, it becomes persistent most of the time as opposed to adults. So it's a perfect target for this vaccine. So human papillomaviruses are also able to cause cancers as we have mentioned. These are viruses, small double-stranded DNA viruses, over 170 different types that mostly cause warts, right? You know what a wart is, those, those not nice looking things which could be all over you. And some of these viruses, and most of them you pick up environmentally. So as I said before, if you walk at barefoot in locker rooms, you will pick up other people's papillomaviruses because they're shed from the, off their skin and then you'll get warts on the bottom of your feet and get them on your hands, on your elbows. But the sexually transmitted ones are a problem. They can cause warts, which are not much of a risk, but some of those types, mostly 16 and 18, but there's some others, cause cancers. We have cervical, vaginal, penis, anus, oral pharyngeal cancers, 31,000 a year in the US. All right, and these are not good, very difficult to treat. So what do we do? Half of Americans are infected with the genotypes of HPV that will, are sexually transmitted and which can cause, some of which can cause cancers. Here's a, 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 some statistics recently in men and women in the US, and you can see divided by ethnicity. You can see it's a good proportion of people are seropositive for these viruses. So we developed vaccines to prevent this disease. And the vaccines are, again, they're cancer vaccines. They are a single protein of the virus, a capsid protein produced in either yeast or insect cells. They assemble into capsids, empty capsids, and these are what are injected into you intramuscularly to give rise to antibodies, which eventually uh, go to this, the mucosal regions and protect you from disease. So we have three different ones. We have the first one, which was Cervarix, which was just two types. And then um, Merck had a competitor, which had four types. So 16 and 18 are the major causes of cancers. But then as we vaccinated against those, we saw other types associated with cancer. So we included those. There's a four and a nine valent vaccine now available. And these have to be given before you get sexually active because that's how these viruses are transmitted. If you're 
already sexually active, it's, a, it's of less effectiveness. And if up to a certain age, I think 45 years old, it's no longer has any effect because you've already been infected. So they have a great record against preventing cancer. They're almost 100% effective at preventing cancers if given um, very early in life. And many parents don't wanna give their kids these vaccines because they feel it will make them promiscuous. I once gave a lecture at a high school and I, and, and one of the, I was talking about HeLa cells and papillomaviruses and one guy in the back said, why don't my parents want me to get this vaccine? And I said, because they think you're gonna get more promiscuous. And he laughed and laughed and laughed. <laughs> so it actually studies have been done which show that it's not true. It doesn't make you more promiscuous just because you're now not gonna get cancer because there are other things that you can transmit sexually as well. So that's a really, really good vaccine for preventing uh, those cancers. Now the subunit vaccines are great. Recombinant DNA technology, you can make them quickly. There's no infectious virus, so no problem with that, but they can be expensive. So the papilloma vaccines are like 450, 500 bucks for the three injections. It's not for everybody, right? They have to be injected also, and they have poor antigenicity, which we can fix by adding an adjuvant. So why do they have poor antigenicity? Well, these are inactivated virus. Well, they're not inactivated, they're subunit. They're not infectious, right? So they don't replicate. They don't cause inflammation. They don't kill cells. Remember, when a virus doesn't cause inflammation, you get poor adaptive responses. And so pure viral proteins, Shingrix, the virus-like particles of human papillomaviruses, on their own, they don't cause any inflammation. So we add an adjuvant, a chemical that induces inflammation and you get much better um, antibody and T cell responses. And these are some of the adjuvants that we use. Many of them do trigger inflammation. Some of them are ligands for immune, innate immune receptors. Some of them also help concentrate the antigen at the site of injection and have it slow released but you get better antibody responses when you do that. So there are some alum, AS1, which is in Shingrix. This is um, basically a TLR4 ligand. There's AS4 in Cervarix, which is basically part of bacterial LPS, which is quite uh, stimulatory of innate responses. And then MF59 and others uh, are being developed as well. So these have to be added to an activated or subunit vaccine so you get better immune responses and they work really well. So some new vaccine technologies coming online, a microneedle patch, I, I think this is great. This, re this will replace the needle. So here it's a small square of plastic with tiny uh, basically needles molded into it and you saturate it with vaccine and then you put it on the skin so the needles pierce the, the epidermis and you hold it in place with a Band-Aid. And it's something you could do yourself, right? And also, it's, you don't have any of the needle feel, so fear. So this is being tested for a variety of vaccine applications. The other issue is the ne necessity to keep vaccines frozen. And so what can we do about that? Well, people have found that if you freeze or dry the vaccines in sugars, it thermostabilizes them. So here's an experiment with influenza vaccine they're thermostabilized in sugars. So the, the regular vaccine without the sugar, IAV is influenza A virus, if you heat it at 40 degrees Celsius, which is quite warm, it loses its infectivity, it's log 10 PFU on the y-axis within two days. But if you have it stored with sugars, you can see infectivity drops, but it doesn't go down to zero. So these are being explored to make vaccines last without refrigeration. Obviously 40 degrees is a uh, extreme, but there are some environments where this is encountered routinely. We need a better flu vaccine. It would be nice to have a flu vaccine that we don't have to change every year, right? So that would be a universal flu vaccine that recognizes any new antigenic variant that arises. So one, there are many people working on this because if you have that, maybe you could get vaccinated 
every 10 years, that would be great. So the HA has epitopes, as I said, that, that lead to the production of neutralizing antibodies and they're epitopes on the head. And these are the ones that change every year, but they're stem epitopes shown here in red that don't change. And if you make antibodies against those, you can neutralize infection. The problem is these are immunosubdominant. What does that mean? When you immunize people, most of the antibodies are directed against the head, which is immunodominant, and very few are directed against the stem. So how do you encourage the immune system to recognize the stem? And so this is one approach that's being used. Let's say you take the stem region in green from some human influenza virus that you wanna protect against, and you put a head of some irrelevant virus that doesn't infect people, like H9. And so you will get antibodies against the head mostly and, and some against the stem. And then you come in with a boost where you put a different head on with the same stem. And the idea here is that now you're not gonna get a biased memory response against the head. You're gonna get a primary response against the head and now you'll have a memory against the stem. And you do that again with a different head and maybe that will induce more stem antibodies. So that's one approach to making a universal vaccine because these stem residues are common among all of the uh, isolates. All right, what are some requirements for an effective vaccine? Low cost, ease of administration, provides long lasting immunity, minimal side effects, all of the above. All right, we're gonna have number eight here. Good. Yeah, that's, you guys are gonna to be tough to beat next year. What's next? Attenuated vaccines, replication competent attenuated vaccines. These are vaccines that are infectious. They reproduce in you. So you take a virus and some, you do something to it so it doesn't cause disease, but it will still replicate and you get an immune response. You shouldn't really get disease. You can get an apparent infection, right, with no symptoms, but you shouldn't get even uh, mild disease. So why does this work? So in an activated vaccine, you typically have to give a couple of doses to get the immune response going. So here is a graph on the top, immune response, y-axis, time on the x. One dose, and your, your immune response is in red. Second dose, it takes those cells that have been generated, B and T cells, and further stimulates them. And so by the third dose, you have a good repertoire. So remember, you're not, you're not just expanding the cells, but you're doing somatic hypermutation to get the highest affinity antibody. But with a replication competent vaccine, the idea is you give an initial dose, it's replicating for an extended period of time, it's amplifying that initial dose and therefore you don't have to give boosters. In some cases we do use boosters like for the polio vaccine because the three serotypes interfere with each other if you give them together, so you have to give three doses. All right, so how do you make these viruses? In the old days, it was empirical. <clears throat> what does that mean? Well, here's an example. We take a human virus that's pathogenic and we grow it normally in human cells, but then we grow it in some other cell, like a monkey cell. And we keep doing that over and over and over until the idea is that we now select for viruses that grow preferentially in the monkey cell and not as well in the human cell. Or I should say that produce disease in say non-human primates, but not in humans. So this is an empirical process, it can take a long time. And it depends on the fact that viruses mutate all the time, right? So you're selecting out those mutants that have this property. We don't do this much anymore. We do it genetically by altering the genome in a way that we think will reduce virulence, but will not impair replication. So an example of this vaccine is flu mist, which is one of the uh, flu vaccines that's available. Besides the inactivated vaccines, that we talked about, you can have flu, -ness, flu mist, which is squirted into your nose. It's a replication competent virus that reproduces in your upper tract. And what they do is they, they found some influenza viruses that were cold adapted. That rep so your upper tract is colder than your lower tract, right? And so they found viruses that were cold adapted and could not reproduce in the lung and so then they take those and they reassort in the genes for whatever current strain 
you need. And so it replicates only in the nasal pharynx. You get immunity, but you don't get uh, any disease. And so that's, that is flu mist. I think <clears throat> in theory, this would be the one to get, but it doesn't make any better protective immunity than the injected vaccines in reality. So it's not living up to its promise. But we have oral polio vaccine, which is called OPV, which was developed by Albert Sabin. And this was used in 1961. It replaced the inactivated vaccine because it's very easy to give. You drink it and it, the virus goes to your intestine, it reproduces, you shed it, and in theory, you don't get paralysis, right? So you're now immunizing your intestines, at least for some period of time. You actually protect the intestine from infection for a very short period, whereas IPV never does that. And so we eliminated poliomyelitis from the US uh, after uh, 1979 by the use of this vaccine. And this virus, this vaccine was made empirically by taking the three serotypes of polio virus and passing them in different cells and different animals and at each stage testing it to see if it was virulent in an animal model, non-human primates, and eventually three serotypes that did not cause paralysis when injected right into the spinal cord of non-human primates, they were licensed in the US. So basically we're selecting mutants here that can't cause disease any longer. And these worked really well in clinical trials. They were used extensively in many countries and, and had really good results. So the WHO in 1988 decided that they would use this vaccine to eradicate poliomyelitis uh, by 2000 originally, but it, we, we missed that goal. And it's not even clear that it's possible. So let me tell you for the few minutes left what is going on with this, because this is a really interesting story. We've only eradicated smallpox. So if you ask whether a disease can be eradicated at all, it could be, but there are three requirements. And we fulfilled these for smallpox, which was eradicated in 1978. Smallpox does that to you. It's horrible, right? So this was a good one. You get to eradicate, you get scarred from these lesions for life <clears throat> and it can kill you. Three features are essential for eradication. It can only, the virus can only reproduce in one host, so smallpox is a human virus. The virus infection or vaccination induces lifelong immunity. And the third one, asymptomatic, asymptomatic infections do not contribute to spread. So SARS-CoV-2, 40% asymptomatic infections, you don't know who's infected. You can never eradicate that. And anyway, SARS-CoV-2 replicates in all kinds of other animals as well. But for smallpox, three features were fulfilled and it was eradicated. Now the first two work for polio, but the third one does not. 99% of infections are not paralytic, so it's very hard to know who's infected. So how has this eradication campaign worked? From 1988, we had 125 endemic countries. It went down 10 years later to 40, 10 years later, to um, five. So where are we today? But first, let me just tell you the problem that arose with uh, using that vaccine. It was introduced in the US in 1961. And this is a, a graph of the number of paralytic polio cases on the y-axis with the year. The line is the number, total number of polio cases. And you see it goes down and down and down after OPV introduction. Uh, and the last wild polio cases in 1979 and then you have all these other cases of polio. Well, these bars are cases of polio caused by the vaccine. So at about one and one and a half million doses, the vaccine paralyzes the recipient. And so in the US, we had eight to 12 cases a year. And so after 79, the only cases of polio in the US were caused by the vaccine. So we, of course, we stopped using it. In 2000, we switched back to IPV, and now we no longer have vaccine-associated paralysis. But in retrospect, I think this was unethical to use this vaccine that paralyzed kids. However, we are still using it in many other countries. So what's the status of eradication? Well, first of all, why do we get these cases of polio? The mutations that were selected for during the passage of poliovirus are mainly located in the five prime non-coding region of the genome. 
in this stem loop six here, which is expanded on the right, there are single base mutations in type one, type two, and type three. So these are major determinants of attenuation. It's really interesting that it's an encoding region. When you feed the vaccine to a child and you sample the stool at different times after infection, what you see is that these mutations revert in everyone. So here's 472, which is the type three. And this child received Savin vaccine. And by 35 hours, he, he was shedding a mixture of U, which is in the vaccine, and C, which is in the parental virulent virus. By two days, all the virus being shed is reverted. And amazingly, most kids don't get polio from this. So I think this is a host SNP involved in some way. Nevertheless, it's why we had eight to 12 cases of polio uh, in the US every year, as long as we we're using OPV. All right, so here's the current situation. These are, this is from October, but it's good enough to make the point. These are the cases of polio in the previous 12 months. In 2016 and shortly after, types two and three polio were declared eradicated. We didn't see any more cases of polio caused by those viruses. And the only wild type polio left was causing cases in uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan, you can see right there. And so presumably that's a result of not immunizing because the terrorists up there make it hard for immunizers to work. But because we've, we eradicated type two, it turned out that type two globally was the biggest cause of vaccine associated paralysis. So WHO decided in 2016 to withdraw the type two component from OPV because they said, oh, it's causing polio, so let's not use it. Well, that was a big mistake because now all those green dots are cases of polio caused by OPV type two. <clears throat> so we had a drop in immunization. We had no more immunization and there were still circulating strains of OPV two. And now they, we had 686 cases of polio, mostly type two, some type one vaccine associated polio here in orange as well. Uh, so this is the problem with using OPV and we continue to use it in nations like Africa and elsewhere and it's causing paralysis. So what do we do? How do we eliminate this circulating vaccine derived polio? Because remember, even if we withdrew the vaccine, there was still circulating virus around. And whenever there's an outbreak of type two, WHO goes in and uses OPV2 and reintroduces it into the community. So many countries use OPV. We, we withdrew OPV2 in 2016. It leaves the type two immunity gap and we can't eliminate this circulating virus with IPV because IPV leaves your intestines susceptible. So this virus circulates everywhere, even in an IPV immunized population. So what do you do? Well, a number of years ago, Gates Foundation invested $4 billion to genetically alter OPV2 <coughs> so that they thought it would not revert to virulence and cause paralysis. The engineering the live attenuated polio vaccine to prevent reversion to virulence. And they, they introduced a number of changes in the genome. First, they uh, introduced changes in the, that stem loop that would prevent reversion. Uh, they moved a, the, the Cree sequence. You may remember Cree from our discussion of RNA synthesis. It's essential for your dilation of VPG. They moved it to the five prime end to try and prevent recombination. And they modified the polymerase with two amino acid changes. One to make it more uh, faithful, to make fewer errors, it's called HIFI, and one to eliminate or reduce recombination, RNA, RNA recombination. This is the result of years of molecular biology, biology studies on these viruses. So this was clinically trialed. It was shown to be safe and effective. Uh, and it was authorized by WHO in 2020. It was given to 600 million kids in 28 countries. There is no reversion in the five prime end 100 days after administration and OPV usually reverts within 14 days. So it looks like it worked, right? Wrong. Six kids in DRC, one in Burundi, were paralyzed after getting this virus. And what they, what they excrete are recombinants. We all have enteroviruses related to polio in our gut. And when, they, when you drink the OPV, it recombines with them. And all those changes that were introduced, gone 
they're all removed by recombination. So here's the viruses that they excrete. The left-hand part of the genome is from an, an, an enterovirus in the gut. The right-hand part is from an enterovirus. So all those changes are gone, and all we have left are the capsid proteins. So you can modify for $4 billion, and as soon as you put it in the gut, all those changes are gone. It causes less VAP, vaccine-associated paralysis, than its parent, OPV2, but it still paralyzes kids. And I think it's unethical to use that. So I think this is a failure. And um, you will see if you read the news that OP and OPV1 and 3 are being made and they want to use that globally, which I think is really horrible. So what do we do? I think we should immunize everyone with IPV, but you need a needle to do that. It's probably going to be impossible to do that everywhere. What we need is a new vaccine that gives you mucosal immunity, but is not infectious because it won't be able to cause polio. However, because people think we're gonna eradicate poliomyelitis, uh, you can't research any more on polio uh, because the bureaucrats think it's not needed because they think they'll be able to eradicate poliomyelitis with this NOPV. But it's not gonna work because you'd have to get a vaccine that immunizes everyone without causing paralysis. So we're in a kind of a conundrum here and I'm not sure what the outcome is gonna be. And we can't eradicate the virus for sure because 99% of infections are asymptomatic. But I do think if we globally immunized with IPV, we could eradicate the disease. But remember, IPV doesn't in immunize your gut, so we're always gonna have circulation. And in fact, in the US, we know that poliovirus does circulate. Vaccine-derived polioviruses circulate because in the summer two years ago, there was a case of polio in a resident in Rockland County who had not been immunized. And he was infected with OPV2 that came from someone in another country that had been uh, immunized. So virus is here. The interesting thing is, you know, we could find the virus if we looked in wastewater, right? But the CDC doesn't want us doing that. They don't want you to know that there is polio virus in the US wastewater, which means people are shedding it because if you got IPV, you can be infected and you can shed virus. So this is an interesting situation that we are in. We have a vaccine, we have vaccines that could eliminate poliomyelitis, but they're not use, being used properly. Okay, next time we will talk about another way to uh, cure, a way to cure a virus infection using antivirals.